Well, hello everyone, and welcome for another um, conversation on being polyvagal informed. I'm so delighted and excited today to have uh, Dr. Rebecca Bailey. She's a leading family psychologist and equestrian uh, and who has uh, the equine connection on, you know, polyvagal informed equine therapy. I'll know a little bit more about that and so would you. And uh, I'm excited, Rebecca, to talk to you again. Last time we spoke where it was after, in Florida after um, the PVI summit and it was over frozen yogurt and kind of we were laughing and kind of, I think the whole four days of, you know, learning and being, uh, you know, uh, a student or uh, a learner kind of took off and we it started to be laughter and absurdity altogether. So I'm excited to talk to you again. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. And what I remember about meeting you was just this automatic ventral connection, just heart to heart and um, no, uh, no filter on the humor of, of <laughs> silliness. We were just absurdly silly. So nothing like a good ice cream to let the silliness come out. So uh, I'm so glad. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll talk about, you know, laughter and, you know, the absurd and how that, you know, it opens doors, not just one door to get to know the other and, uh, you know, and connect really on a ventral level. Um, so Rebecca, what is equine therapy to give it, you know, for people who don't know, I haven't experience it but I know it's with horses and I absolutely love horses but if you can give us a little bit about that and how is being polyvagal informed or how are you connecting equine therapy with the polyvagal theory so we have um a program uh, I don't know an institute called the polyvagal equine institute and also to be full disclosure we also have other animals incorporated at times but horses have this amazing instinctual ability to detect safety versus non-safety mm -hmm. and you know we all do and we know that's part of the polyvagal theory but horses go through the moment sort of practicing and modeling flexibility and so you know they might startle for a minute at something behind the rock and then they'll relax down or they'll take off if it's something truly scary and so when you're doing interactions with human to horse you absolutely have the opportunity for a conversation of two nervous systems. Mm -hmm. um, there's an ability, in the old days, people would say horses were a mirror. Mm -hmm. Some people still say that, they're not, they're not. They have their own separate being in interaction with you. So part of the equine training or therapy, I am a licensed psychologist, but part of the training is teaching people how to learn to be open to receive the messages from the horses as well about whatever the horses is, is communicating back to the human. I know that sounds strange, but we'll learn more as we go on. But yeah. it's just beautifully fabulous, wonderful work. Um, and we talked about humor already. Sometimes horses will help people be more open and not so defensive. So somebody might say, that horse is just like me, it's very bossy. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of say, okay, well, tell me more. And then they'll tell you why. And then you can say, well, maybe it's just hungry. And then you have an opportunity for discussion without people feeling offended mm -hmm. or um, defended that they have to push away like you've said a bad thing about them or something. Yeah. So is it in a way much easier to deal with a, you know, with a horse? It's, it's not a human, and especially with people coming from, with, from a trauma uh, experience and in whatever form it is. Do I understand that the horses as a, another nervous system could feel safer than a human? Yes. Yes. Because um, people that have been through severe trauma or been exposed to traumatic experiences, vulnerability is difficult. So connecting to another nervous system can feel 
impossible because they may be so shut down and horses and we also know other animals can do this too but horses in particular have a way of connecting so they feel it in their body mm. and then maybe then they're able to either be more self-reflective or just connect out of themselves i've had people in the program who have been very traumatized who don't who can't talk very much and they're very shut down and in grooming the horse they'll begin to speak about what happened and it may be that oxytocin and vasopressin is going. Um, it may be just the connection of something else so that they're not sitting in a room eye to eye with you. But I've been doing this now for about 35 years and really have seen how valuable that interaction can be. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm wondering about the horse nervous system and uh, having having, you know, the same nervous system as as we do um how do they feel and can you know regulate or dysregulate with with another human do they have this kind of amazing ability to self-regulate or what we call self-regulate and not have um how does it work i'm really curious on on what I goes on with the horse nervous system well, two things you're bringing up. One is the respect for the horse in a way, because we really do believe that uh, most of the work we do, the horse is not held on a halter unless the person's afraid, um, because you do want to, you can't just, in our perspective, you can't just pick anybody, any horse to do the work, because there are some horses that are very, very sensitive. And um, they may be very good for a particular population or not at all. Okay. But so... What we know, at least in my experience, and you know, maybe someday somebody will discover something very different, but as horses are very flexible in their ability to sort of experience what we call the carousel, what Deb Dana might call the ladder, that you know, all those feelings, those blended states, they're able to shake it off. Now their brain, their cerebral cortex is smaller. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, therefore it means they're not as intelligent I think they have a different type of intelligence. They yeah. have this ability to really pay attention to an intuition um, in their body. Like this is this person doesn't feel authentic. And yeah. many of us who've done this work for many years will tell you that sometimes our go-to horse will have a reaction to somebody that makes you go, huh? And then sometimes you might find out what that variable is, whether they're terrified or you know, there may be something more darker in who they are. I don't know, but I've had that experience even with um, people not in in the workshops directly where I thinking of an individual who lived in my neighborhood and my horse just did not want to be around this person and would actually move away, which is very unusual. And it did turn out that there was some very um, predatory behavior of this in this individual. I didn't know. He just seemed like a funny, nice guy. So um, they do, they pay attention to the nervous system devoid of past sort of cognitive processes of overanalyzing is what I think. They're yeah. also very non-judgmental. They're not going to think, Rebecca, that's an ugly shirt you're wearing today. You know, <laughs> they're going to think, you know, the only time I've ever had my horse act very different was after a fire, we lost the house and all of our clothes. And so I was wearing clothes that were donated to me for a couple of weeks. And I would go near her and she would put her nose up and try to smell. Like you could tell she was like, I know this is her, but it doesn't feel like her. That was a really interesting experience. Oh, wow. That's 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 fascinating. And and as you're talking, it's it's what comes to mind is like children, like you know, toddler, they would know because they don't have that cognitive kind of frontal cortex and they would, you know, repel or kind of push pull back from certain people. And unfortunately, we're we're in a culture where we don't most of the time kind of take that into account but it, and it, it's interesting when you said that not every horse work with everyone so it, in my head I'm thinking oh so there are <laughs> there are therapist a horse therapist who, who have <laughs> an ability to work with and regulate in if I want to put it in 
our words. And then maybe there are some other horses who are who don't have the capacity or too sensitive to be working or do that. Is that is that correct, how I'm Yeah, saying? I mean, I'll give you an example. I have a bunch of too many horses than anybody should have, but um, <laughs> I would always take more. So I have um, one mare who, if somebody is very, very anxious, when I first began working with her, she would literally colic, which means horses can't throw up. And so when they're agitated in their stomach, which is probably a vagal pathway piece, they um, they could get very sick and die because their intestines will turn. And she, you know, if it gets to a certain point, she just could not be around highly anxious individuals. The ones that you could see sort of from day one. And so I never use her with those people, work with her with those people anymore. I have another black and white, beautiful horse who is very expressive and sets boundaries with everybody, but I would not put certain very sensitive people with her because they take it very personally. Oh. Unless they were connected enough with me where I could say, you know, like for example, I had a group of beautiful three girls that came and they were in their early teens. And I asked them to approach the black and white horse in a way that was comfortable for them and the horse, polyvagal training. And they were supposed to brush the horse. That was the task. And the three girls got in a circle around her and were standing there and they were really happy. And I said, you guys aren't brushing. And they said, no, 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 she's not ready for us to touch her yet. Mm. And I was like, wow, I'd never in all my years seen them that intuitive. And they were right. When they got close to her, she would put her ears back and she was very, they weren't afraid of her. She was just very clearly saying no. Now, if somebody's super, super sensitive, you wouldn't want to have them because we the stories we put in our head connected to our nervous system can be so toxic <laughs> to how we how we work in the field. Now, that same in the world, that same horse is amazing with one on one work with someone who trusts me or my colleagues um, where we can say, well, isn't that interesting? She's putting her ears back. And they can say, well, she hates me. And you can say, okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. Then you go, what if I said it's dinner time and you're supposed, she wants to eat right now. And then suddenly you see the relief come off of them and they can do an alternative hypothesis to the rejection they were experiencing. Oh, wow. That's, um, that's it's fascinating. And I, I want to be right there where you are and, 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 and be with all the horses. And I, I'm curious, how do you see, you know, how many horses do you have? Well, I have four here on my small piece of property, too many. And then my dear friend who I do a lot of work, a private barn, you guys have seen um, JC and Margie McDonald who do the Polyvagal Equine Institute. Between all of us, we have 16. Oh, that's, it doesn't sound that uh, it's a lot, I'm sure for, for a horse, but how do you see the interaction from a poly, among the horses themselves? from a polyvagal lens? Um, so much about an awareness of where it's landing in your system. So when you can get people, even people that have been in lots and lots of therapy or people that have never done therapy, if you come at it from a um, bottom-up perspective of where did that interaction land in your body? Instead of saying, how do you feel? Where do you feel? Where, where does it land in your body? What's that piece? They can begin to pay attention to how their autonomic nervous system guides them through the world, through situations. And then the horses in so many ways, I mean, this is really silly, but it's a good thing they don't talk because it allows us to be able to really see nonverbal communication that is completely coming from ANS, completely. Um, it, it's rare to see a horse go in a complete dorsal shutdown in utmost fear because their go-to is a fight flight. Okay. But you can also see horses that have been in very restricted environments um, where like maybe a show horse who's doing all these shows between the, between the events, they'll look sort of in a blended state of a dorsal ventral shutdown. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And you can see it. If you begin to use that language, then you can work with your clients to language. So we also have videos that people can use in the office with clients to begin to project, not anthropomorph anthropomorphize, but project onto the horse or whatever, maybe what they're feeling in their body. Not to say the horse is just like me, but, but to be able to begin to access their own sort of polyvagal journey in their body. Yeah. So what does a, a ventral uh, horse uh, behavior look like? So horses live in herds. And as we know, all mammals are very dependent on each other, at least early on for survival. Horses in particular, um, even domesticated horses, if they had their choice, they would live in families or herds together. Maybe not every, like not every horse wants to be thrown into a herd with another horse because there's certain hierarchical roles that they take at different points. But um, what you'll see is definitely when you're around a horse, if you slow down enough, we have a way of saying hello where we'll put a fist like it's a nose, not like a punch of fist mm -hmm. and hold it to a horse and allow the horse to choose whether they wanna say hello. And it's kind of a fun thing to do because you will literally see some horses come up, they're curious, they say hello. Some horses will look and just, and, and you're not threatening at all, just get that clear since this isn't TV, you can't see, but it's just a, it's a hello with like a hand, like a little nose thing. And they'll come up and smell and say hello and you can feel it in your ventral pathways. And they are definitely connecting with you. I mean, you can't ignore that feeling. And you also can't ignore when they kind of look at you and say, no, thank you and walk off. Yeah, that's, um, I think I, I've been a horses for some time, but not a lot, but that sounds also a lot like a cat, which is my <laughs> favorite pet animal. And, and that would, they would come and, and, kind of rub on and let you play with them. And then at that point is like, uh-uh, no, I'm good. Uh, I don't I think, think them. I'm also a huge cat fan. I do think horses are more flexible in going back to a, you know, like your cat when they're get overstimulated and they're attacking your hand and you're like, I don't know if you have a cat that does that. It's like, whoa. Um, and you're not going to touch it for a bit. A horse will go a little more flexibly back to a regulated straight state. Mm -hmm. So you said it earlier, they really can demonstrate regulation. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you don't wanna be thinking about thoroughbreds in fight flight racing down the track. That's not what we're talking about, but even them watch those horses go down the track full force. Then they come in and you see them regulate down into an area where there's people surrounding them and putting roses on their neck. They may still be agitated, but, but it's amazing. They can go from that activated state to that next state that seamlessly. Yeah, I, I just wonder what's, what goes on with, with horses who are put on racetracks or shows or, or some other kind of touristic. I, I feel so bad, you know, for these horses that are kind of a tourist kind of hop on and 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 go around and they're barely you know most of the time not kept in a very good condition i just wonder about how but it's interesting that you say their nervous system is quite flexible right? and they need play they need play just like we do um i've had the experience of being around some olympic dressage horses the fancy sort of dancing on horses and one of them, one of the things they would do is take that horse to the beach once a week bareback and ride in the waves so the horse could play and then put him with their friends. So like for me, one of the things that I believe so much from a polyvagal perspective is the importance of incorporating play into everything we do somehow, not everything we do, obviously, but that play piece is so important and horses need it just as much as humans do especially adults. I don't know, Becca, when did one ever got the memo of being an adult is don't play. Is like, play is okay when you're a child. Maybe at this, this day and age is not enough, but it's like, you're an adult. You, like, you somehow don't play. It has to be regulated. It's so funny that you say that because it's almost like 
we either go back to parallel play or connected competitive play. We've lost that sort of ability. Not, I think maybe in some ways, maybe that's what dance and things like that do, where we're allowed to sort of engage again. But I'm such a believer in play. Sometimes when families have come over the years to the program or when we teach other professionals, a whole, oops, a whole half an hour will be play or longer than that of like, I just thinking of, we had a whole thing with a mop where we were dancing with, and it seems totally ridiculous. And you have to be very confident to do this with like the president of a university, a big <laughs> university. Oh, I yeah. not would know that, but just saying, and because they don't, and some of those people have never learned to play even as kids. Yeah. They never did. Yeah, it's it, it almost, uh, there's uh, what we started, how we met like the absurdity and the in the being just silly it's just it's such a nice i feel like one of those silly things that when it happens it's like you know it, it doesn't make a person less of uh an expert in in a field or, or just kind of like it i don't know how we got to, att to attach these concepts of you know silliness is is almost like Childlike. I, I, I grew up in a, a family on the east coast of the U.S. who um, many of them were Harvard professors or very distinguished individuals and there was a period every summer that we would go to an island off the coast of Maine very privileged but they would just be silly and funny and ridiculous and I remember like watching it and like almost seeing a different human being. But really now that I think about it from a polyvagal perspective, they were practicing their nervous system <laughs> and like truly playing, you know, running around with wearing seaweed in their hair and things that are so ridiculous, but just loosening all that rigidity in the inside. Yeah, I, I, when you started to, to tell that story, I was thinking, but you know the exact opposite of what they would do because I would I could see that rigid and uh of like professors and all that like no you have to kind of maintain that composer and I wonder if if nature has a big part of you know when of um first of all co-regulation with nature where you're in a in a in a water environment where the environment is is co-regulating and helping us to helping individual to be in that ventral more instead of being in offices in city life where there isn't that much of even kind of a good force if I would say from nature of like loosen up kind of mm -hmm. like a thing I don't know yeah I think nature is such an important peace I think we're also we get so embedded in judgment of ourself and other people which to me judgment blame and then shame live in sympathetic and dorsal I think I think yeah. shame is just a complete dorsal I'm going to be pushed out of the herd. I'm embarrassed. And we just, we live in so much of that. Um, and, you know, I think I'm, I'm probably, I don't know how much older than you. I know I'm a little older than you at least. And it's taken time to be able to be like, I could just be completely goofy. Although most of the people that know me would say I've been goofy my whole life. So <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying, but, but you know. Maybe, maybe goofy in, 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 more setting than used to. Yes, I, I worry less about judgment and I worry less about, um, well, I don't know that I've ever really worried too much, but I worry less about being buttoned up or that, you know, I don't leave situations thinking, oh my gosh, should I do something wrong or whatever? And it is about play. It's the power of play and humor and flexibility in your nervous system. Yeah, I, I notice now as soon as I'm in self-judgment or, you know, judging others, I'm in my survival 
states. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not, I don't have enough ventral, you know, and that's, it, it became a, an instant clue of like, okay, now I, and it's almost never, never feels good. And even though when I'm kind of have enough ventral and I look at the same situation without the judgment, it feels much better. It doesn't make the situation better or worse. The situation is still, but with taking that judgment and I'm, as I noticed it in myself, it's that's my survival. That's okay. So it's, it's not going to work for me just to say, oh, no judgment. No, I need some ventral so that no judgment can come automatically. Um, Rebecca, and I wanted this one thing because uh, we talked about it then and you, I didn't understand it and you helped me understand it. And I wanna talk uh, to you um, to, today about it is that this um, un, still unknown kind of a survivor response or state, which a lot of people call fawn, um, which you absolutely have seen you, you know, kind of like, no, this, you cannot be calling this yeah. response of fun with, with, with all your, and, and it's appeasement. And I know I've watched uh, the interview um, on the Polyvagal Institute and it's free for anyone to go and watch. It's really uh, helped me understand a lot of what appeasement is. And I think, um, especially as I've, I notice it more in, in women, not, not just in a, in, a, in a very abusive kind of traumatic um, situation, but this whole need to be, you know, kind of be the good girl to please, um, which sounds like appeasement. Um, could you tell me first why fawning is, is a term you absolutely, dare I say, hate. <laughs> well, I, I, I tell you, yeah. and people in certain cultures have said to me, I was raised to fawn. And two things, what that would imply is a cognitive process to be conscious of quote unquote fawning. That is very different where in, from <laughs> appeasement, which really is an innate kind of um, auto, you, you, you get into it without any sort of cognitive process. Now, the reason I'm so adamant against fawning, that word, the use of that word is, I do a lot of forensic work, not as much anymore as I used to, but we made it our business to stamp out Stockholm syndrome because it was so offensive to say that people fell in love with their captor. Maybe some people would say there was this trauma bond, but love was a very offensive word to many people. Mm -hmm. The word fawning forensically assumes and by virtue of the word itself, states a cognitive buy-in or cogn whether it's for survival or not. So for me, you bring that into a courtroom again and you have a defense attorney saying, well, my goodness, didn't you fawn? Therefore you're culpable on some level. That's one level of why I'm so, so like, please let's be really, really careful. I also see that fawning implies a very vulnerable, very, um, a very uh, immature be being. When we think of a fawn, a little defensive being, appeasement is a superpower. Appeasement is the ability to um, calm the savage beast without conscious awareness, really, um, to be able to access deep dorsal at the same time as engage the social engagement system. That is not an innocent, not the word innocent isn't right, but that is not a little defenseless being. Yeah. So it's good. twofold. One is the way it can be used, which I think we we keep using words to describe women in really infantilizing ways. And we see this over and over in history, <laughs> you know, and we're not infants. We're not. We, you know, where appeasement is a superpower 
fawning connotes this infant behavior. Yeah, and when I went to dictionary and, and look at fawning, and, and there's a, what I've noticed there's in some definition, there's a way of kind of a flirtatious kind of like, uh, I want you to like me where, where it's the appeasement is, I know that I could be in danger, so I'm going to smile and say, yes, okay, um, I'm going to do it. And, and, and it's as simple as, you know, as, as children, like some of this thing that you have with an adult, I don't know if that happens in the state, but it does happen in the, a lot in the Arab world is like, you know, parent kind of crossing boundaries and then the child would have to go and say, I'm sorry, even though that the adult is the one who needs to say, I'm sorry. So, but there is that not cognitive decision, as you say, of like, I need to just smile and do what I'm told Otherwise, it's going to be terrible. So I'm going to be this good girl who smiles and say yes. And that to me is, is not, it's not like I want you to like me. I just yeah. don't want you to hurt me, which is very it, different. It's co-regulation, right? I'm going to co-regulate you. Fawning is not co-regulation. And in the animal world, an aggressive animal that has somebody fawn, at them uh, and uh, another animal is more likely to be attacked. At least that's my understanding. I'm not an expert in all things animal, but that's been my understanding. If you have an aggressive dog and the dog cowers, the dog is going to go even more. Whereas appeasement, and I actually just clicked, it just clicked in my head hearing you. It's co-regulation. I'm going to, with my nervous system, unconsciously bring you, try to bring you unconsciously to to a regulated state yeah and and to just contain the situation so things don't get worse uh because then who knows what would happen if i say no or or not uh do that but and then that's the thing with the social engagement and i've always had this in my head and i don't know how you know dr porges or deb see it but that social engagement could kind of be on play in a survival state of like exactly smiling and, and using all those kind of tonality and all just to say, I'm okay, but from the inside, there's, you know, two, you know, dorsal and sympathetic is, are going what? raised up and all, all sorts of things, but there has to be this facial kind of, uh, um engagement even though that it might not be authentic yeah. and i'm as i'm saying that you know in in the face of someone who is dysregulated if say in a fight they wouldn't even notice that the smile is is disingenuous or it's not authentic but it feels like okay this person is smiling they're okay and it sounds a lot like co-regulation um, like you it's said. interesting because going back to the horses, I have a friend that I sometimes teach with and she does this exercise where she shows how powerful you can be with sort of a smile regulated presence. And yet when, she, when she's interacted with me, I get internally, I'm more angry. It's very interesting. So I think what you were just reminding me of, which takes us back to the horses and human to human is also this neuroceptive ability in our body to detect whether something, you know, what, what whether there's a danger or not, right? And yeah. so for some people in some neurodiverse communities, um, maybe eye contact is going to be more activating than non and And sometimes we don't have the ability to think that through. We just feel it in our bodies. And that's how the horses interact with us too. We just feel something, never in an unsafe, like you'd never put people with equine therapy in an unsafe situation, mm -hmm. but you really do encourage people to really pay attention to what does this feel like? So what we're saying is when we interact in the world, that neuroception that's going on, that TSA agent, as he calls it, is going on all the time. Now, one of the things, interestingly, recently, there has been the notion of adaptable versus maladaptive neuroception. 
um, good versus bad. And I'm going to just be really um, out on a limb. I don't believe we should distinguish it like that because my experience in treating severe trauma is helping people to really believe it was all okay. It was all okay. And yes, maybe every time there's a thump in the room, they startle a little bit, but the, but to label their neuroception as that's maladaptive or adaptive goes back into more shame and blame, which puts them back into a shutdown. So that's another, you, you see that I'm always picking, picking fights out here. But. <laughs> so it's a sympathetic and zero away from home, I'm assuming. I, I just have <laughs> seen it so important, you know, working with an individual who had been trafficked uh, from two years old to 10, just amazing person who just had so many messages about how their um, nervous system had let them down as a child to trust people and how now it's so hard to trust and how something was wrong with their nervous system. And it's been so helpful for this person to be told, no, your nervous system kept you alive. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest messages of, you know, for me, my learning and why I feel I love the polyvagal theory and, and, and looking at the work from that lens of like, it, it's, it, you know, it's a superpower, like you say, it's, it, it kept us alive. It knew what to do before even we had an idea of what we need to do. And it, that's how it kind of been shaped, like Deb would say, and we just need to reshape it because it's no longer now useful to have that reaction anytime a sound comes in but that's a very real experience and I, I I agree with you with like there's no maladaptive neuroception the neuroception is there for a reason it's yeah. just kind of to reshape and re learn the system that you know and increase capacity at, to be able to notice this is a sound, it's all right, but it's not a cognitive process whatsoever. And, right. and plus, you know, where the shame falls off with, you know, with looking at our nervous system's reaction, it just needed to do what it needed to do. And right. It still does until you're able to internalize enough safety to then be able to move out of a response that is maybe not matched to the event. So that's that word not matched to me is better than maladaptive, adaptive, good versus bad. So many um, victim survivors carry just, as you know, so much self-deprecation that it doesn't help them to add another light level. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, and I found that now that I've I think I have enough capacity most of the time to, to navigate the world without being in survival all the time. But I've noticed that even the, you know, the patterns that happens, I would get, I would still get that kind of frustration, annoyance, whatever that, that takes me into survival, but there's enough ventral in the system to allow me to kind of step back and look at it and say, oh, that is amusing and the same situation as I say you know goes from frustrating and annoying to amusing yep yep just because there's that bit of ventral in in, in well you're way. like me I think you travel a lot and so I travel a lot and when I'm at my very best um I'm able to go from uh, to amusing and I I really I I was bringing a, a puppy back from another state and I lost my ability and I was really, I got mad, you know, and I thought about that later and I thought, because I became almost self-righteous about my ability to bring the dog on the plane and just cause she was, you know, 0.5 too heavy. And, and then that's the first time in years that I've really lost my balance in an airport. I wasn't terrible, yeah. but I use when I practice, when I fly, as an opportunity to practice that. <laughs> I really do. I'll be like, no, you're gonna go from here to here and be flexible and amused by all of this. And it's 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 helped me. It's, I think it's saved some years on my life. <laughs> yeah, I, it's same here. And I find when I've had enough sleep, 
when I uh, had, you know, enough water, these simple basic needs, I'm a far better person and I have more capacity and, and can navigate those, those um, situation. And, and you, when you're saying you travel a lot, I, I think that also internally in terms of uh, states, I travel, go to from ventral to sympathetic to dorsal, like <laughs> like a million times a day. And it's it's quite an interesting uh, way to observe. It's like, oh, I just got a that talk into uh, a, a dorsal, and I'm you know I'm I'm back. Uh, and oh, well, Rebecca, we could speak. I, I think I've I. If anyone is watching every interview or every conversation, I keep saying the same thing. I, you know, we could talk for hours. I could personally talk for hours about polyvagal and every day I'm learning more about myself and the world through the polyvagal lens. But, you know, I'm noticing we're coming to the end of our conversation and I'm wondering how is this work evolving to you? How are you seeing more through that polyvagal lens, I'm assuming you're like me, you're kind of seeing something nuanced. There is a nuance every day. What's your what, nuance when it comes to- Well, I, I just, I'm more and more beginning to, I don't know if it's new, but really to embrace the resiliency and the power of the human spirit you know, more and more and more and really helping people get out of narratives in their heads that lead them into the same dead ends over and over again. I don't know if that really answers what you're saying, but the more I really pay attention to like, just unlocking the wisdom of the autonomic nervous system, the ventral, the, the vagal pathways, the more it helps people get into curiosity, compassion, communication, and connection, and reminding clients, even couples and arguing, you know, just really reminding them, get back to compassion. And they'll leave my office or even, you know, individuals, and they'll leave the office and come back in, whether it's with the horses or not, and say, I really thought about it this weekend, and I could really hear this person talk to me for the first time. It's just, self-compassion too right that opens those pathways uh absolutely and and i really got the 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 what i say the meaning of compassion is through the polyvagal theory and the nervous system of like oh so i i'm not a terrible person as you said self-compassion to myself because i have told myself top down like, okay, be compassionate and all of those things. I'm, But when I really realized like all the terrible things that I've did and all the terrible things that I've said were coming out of that survival where I am, you know, in that state that I couldn't possibly have the capacity to do otherwise. It's like, okay, so yeah, that's- Does it also- it helps with curiosity too. I mean, in the US, we're so polarized right now and we continue to be, and I can't say I can always pass, I can always practice, but when I hear somebody's views that are very different than mine, I'm really working at being really curious. Like, it's really interesting. You know, we were talking about this earlier, like, how can you see that painting look like that? That's different than me. Doesn't mean I don't grumble when I get in my car or get off the you know, Zoom call, but um, at least in that moment, I can communicate and connect. And it's that ability to just connect somehow, regardless of our viewpoints. Yeah, I, um, it's, I, I wonder, it's like, I wonder what's going on with their nervous system that would have that story build up and all of these kind of behavior. It doesn't make it any easier to deal with. Yeah. But, and I've, I've, especially with dealing with kind of difficult individuals. And I know as it, when it comes to the political thing, I don't have enough capacity to venture. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I know, me neither. I'm with you. In my bubble. But dealing with difficult people in, in, in my life, in, in, you know, in everywhere, it's like, you know, even people who are not, one day I was at the train station and I was asking the, uh, someone who works there and he was kind of really rude and I felt like, <laughs> and then, 
I wonder what's going on with him. Um, and that didn't make me feel less frustrated or annoyed, but it's like, oh, that curiosity of, and I hope, you know, you know, curiosity is a ventral, you know, um, well, what, what's the fancy word for that emerging property? <laughs> you know, I did that yesterday, driving down the road, a big truck came right up and I'm in a little Prius, you know, and people in America, truck, tr trucks don't like Priuses. And I, I drive a truck because I have horses at some point, but I'm in my Prius and this car was right on me, riding me on, on, on. And I was getting really mad. And I finally just went, oh, I really did. I was by myself. I said, I think this man is in sympathetic. I think I'll wave him by. <laughs> you know? And I sort of pulled sideways and waved him by. And he went by really fast. And another truck went by really fast. And I was just like, oh. And then I could let it go. And that's what a horse does. I could let it go. I didn't sit there and ruminate about anything else. I just said, sympathetic. I'm enjoying the day. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, a, that noticing name that Deb talks about is just really uh, does wonder. Uh, it's um, so much fun talking to you, Rebecca. And I, you know, I don't, I don't have any planned trip to the U.S. anytime soon. But I hope if I do, I'll come to the and come to the West Coast. Um, come to North Cal Northern California. Come to one of our. Polyvagal Equine Institute workshops. Go on and see our workshops. Um, we even do have videos that you can use in working with clients or so. Can you can you tell us more about the, the, the institute? It's Polyvagal Equine Institute. They were kind enough to let us use the word polyvagal, okay. which was really sweet. Um, and the perspective is yes, we're training. We do have a, we train other professionals how to do the work, but we also have a personal and professional training for people that want to enhance their own ability to access um, and understand their own nervous system. So there's two tracks. Hopefully we will have people all over the world that have the ability to do this work in the way that we do it. Right now we have South Africa, we're working on Australia, we have France, we have Belgium, we have the US. So we're really hoping eventually to have people be able to go on our website and say, oh, there's somebody working like this here in my area, so. Yeah, I, I know two people um, who are doing different things. I don't know if it's therapy or, but they do work with horses and in, in that kind of a um, holistic, I'm, I don't wanna, but I, I don't know exactly what they're doing. So I, I would send this interview to them and, and, and hopefully they could, uh, we could have Saudi uh, and on the map as well. So um, maybe I could come to, to your area and do a training and see you in person because that would be lovely. Well, yeah, I hope uh, when, if you go um, uh, there, I'll be there. I'm currently yeah. in the London, UK and I'm going to be here. So if you ever are here, please yep. do let me know. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much, Rebecca, for this. It's uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, so many um, insights that comes uh, with this conversation. Appreciate your time. You too. Thank you so much. Take care.